Now we turn to a reading from the scriptures. It is a text that is foundational to Judaism. It is, of course, deeply connected to Christianity. The descendants of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah are in Egypt. Long after Joseph of the amazing Technicolor dream coat has died, his descendants have become enslaved in Egypt, and God hears their cries, sends Moses, and on the night of their departure from Egypt, this word comes to them. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts, the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs." Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its heads, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn, and this is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, human beings and animals, and all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall celebrate it as a perpetual ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Presbyterians, among whom the saints of DCPC are numbered, Presbyterians are fond of few words. Pastors of earlier generations, for instance, were known to often use the word predestination. There's a Presbyterian word. Now, our reading from Exodus today has a word from which we might extract another favorite Presbyterian word. Now, the word in Exodus that I just read is perpetual. It came right at the end of the reading, and no, it's not an adjective to append to the phrase Peter's preaching. God commanded the children of Israel who are about to be set free to celebrate the Passover perpetually. The people who were set free were now bound to remember. Those who were a tabula rosa for the community about to be made have now had the first words and actions etched on their hearts and their life together. Remember perpetually. Do not forget to remember the Passover For millennia now, ever since this command, which is maybe around 1250 BCE, for millennia Jews have remembered God's saving grace through the Passover. During pogroms and persecution, in peace and in prosperity, in the horror of the Holocaust and the holiness of the synagogue, they have remembered. As I note the foundation of the Passover celebration, it is a good time to remember our Davidson Jewish neighbors who are entering the high holy days this week, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. In fact, I have a meeting with Rabbi Becca and Rabbi David at Temple Kol Tikva a little later this month during Sukkot, and we get to meet in their booth, and I am so excited by that. I think one of the last times I was proximate to a rabbi during a holy day was when my wife, Sean Samuelson Henry, and I attended a Passover with one of her teacher colleagues. He and his husband, who was a rabbi, invited us to celebrate with them and with their two infant by Rachel children. It was a holy night, to be sure. I linger here for a moment 
because with the rise of Christian nationalism and the overt hate acts against a variety of traditionally marginalized, marginalized groups in our country, we also need to be aware of the need for Christians to combat the rise of anti-Semitic language and behavior in our country. It's sad that one of the perpetual features of Judaism is struggling with hate against them, struggling with that hate. It's part of our struggle, too, as we help them to celebrate the high holy days. Now, speaking of perpetual, I didn't yet extract that uber-Presbyterian word that relates to this passage in Exodus, but I tell you what, in order to help me share that Presbyterian word, I thought you might enjoy this more than hearing it from me. A fiddler on the roof. Sounds crazy, no? But here, in our little village of Anatevka, you might say every one of us is a fiddler on the roof, trying to scratch out a pleasant, simple tune without breaking his neck. It isn't easy. You may ask, why do we stay up there if it's so dangerous? Well, we stay because Anatevka is our home. And how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition! You knew it was coming. Tradition. Presbyterians love tradition. And you know what Presbyterians love talking about? Presbyterian pastors, you know what we love talking about? We love talking about how our Presbyterian churches struggle with changing traditions. At a former church, the congregation where I served had a growing number of children and youth and adults with gluten intolerance. And yet, despite knowing this was a barrier to full participation in communion, the church came up with a variety of reasons to keep our separate but equal practice in order to preserve gluten-full communion bread for most everybody. Baggies with gluten-free cubes in the back, separate serving stations up front. But when our members who were gluten intolerant asked about going 100% gluten-free, they were told that gluten-free bread doesn't taste as good, it's more expensive, and when it comes down to it, it's traditional to use gluten-full bread. When we finally went all gluten-free, I heard members of the church weeping, talking about how much it meant to finally receive communion just like everybody else in the same manner, one loaf, one body, full participation. One of those members recently said to me, when a waiter gives me a gluten-free menu, he's telling me that he is my champion in the kitchen and creating a welcoming env environment. Peter, when our church went gluten-free, you were telling those of us who are gluten intolerant that you are our champion. Scholars of Christian worship like James White will tell you that the history of the Christian church and its worship, even for Presbyterians, is in fact a history of change, even if the change comes slowly. For instance, did you know that Presbyterians in the United States used to worship twice a day? Twice a day, people! Go home, grab lunch, rest, come on back up and see if Pastor Henry has a better sermon this afternoon. Things might change slowly, but they change. And of course, we've seen recent rapid change in American Christianity. And I know that in the Southeast, we were slow to the party of changing church attendance and participation. But the pandemic caught us up, and it has accelerated that for everyone. I won't bore you with statistics on church membership, attendance, in-person attendance, and volunteerism. But suffice it to say, it's not all good which is, of course, a source of puzzlement for many of us. For at the same time that we can analyze and dissect American Christianity in new and deeper ways, we can also read the obvious writing on the wall when it comes to the mental health struggles of our country. 
including the epidemic of loneliness that we hear so much about. That's right. At the same time that people are pulling away from organized religion, they are saying they are lonelier, sadder, and struggling with mental health more than ever before across all generations. Even though we know that participating in a loving, hope-filled community of faith is correlated with better health emotionally, psychologically, and physically, being part of a positive faith community is literally good for you. And I am sure with me you can surmise some of the reasons that good religion lowers anxiety, reduces stress, improves your brain, and makes you stronger emotionally and psychologically. Not a panacea, don't get me wrong, but it is part of God's prescription for better health. Good Rx, you might say. Maybe that's why God told the Israelites to make their Passover perpetual. Why he made sure that those with ample resources shared with those who did not and that all received what was necessary for the journey ahead. If nothing else, God's call to not forget to remember is a reminder that despite the ways that we might fool ourselves with myths of self-made men and women, we cannot make it alone in this world. So to the Israelites, when you're free, when you're on top, when you're in charge, do not forget to remember that you need God, you need each other, and that you were once slaves who needed deliverance. To the American Presbyterians who can be as alone as we have ever been, who might seem to be doing just fine online, on the road, apart from others, do not forget to remember that you need God and you need each other. Do not be people who are so often forgetting to remember. So in order to help you to remember, I want to say something to you today that you will hear from me regularly. We are better together. We are better together here at 100 North Main Street. When it comes to the ways that worship is good for us, I do not want to seem to make it sound as though worship in the sanctuary is the end-all, be-all of the Christian life. As theologian Shane Claiborne has said, for Christians, Sunday worship is like a huddle in the football game. The problem is that a lot of people act like the huddle is the football game. Now, I know that when you're in the huddle, you can start to identify with the team so much that you see all others and the world as opponents. My friend, Father Elias Shakur, is a Melkite priest in Israel. He likes to tell the story of being a young priest in his Palestinian village, a small village which in the 1960s had a very divided Christian population. A Greek Orthodox minister, part of the other team, had given Shakur a vine tree that Shakur had planted in the churchyard of his Melkite church. One of Shakur's elders demanded that Shakur remove the vine tree, noting that it had come from one of them. But Shakur wanted to build peace among Christians, and thus he wanted to keep the tree. So in a rather unorthodox action, Shakur had the elder bring him a bucket of water. Father Shakur took the water, and with three big splashes, he says that he baptized the tree in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then told the elder that the tree now had to stay because it was a Melkite Christian tree. I can tell you that the tradition of Christian enmity eventually ended in Ibeline, Shakur's village. On that front, there has been a happy ending, which does remind me of a quote from the best exotic Marigold Hotel, everything, everyone has a happy ending. If you're not happy, it's not the end. As Christians who fulfill the perpetual ordinance to worship God, we might transpose the word happy to blessed or to hopeful. For that is the calling of the church to give thanks to God, to proclaim to one another that God delivers, that God saves. At the first Passover through Jesus and in our life, God saves. We tell each other this in word and deed, in worship and in small groups, letting one another know that we are not alone, that we are better together, and that the blessedness of our ending begins now together. That is our calling to proclaim that good news always. I pray we will never forget to remember and to share together.
this good news. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.